<clears throat> Psalm 52. Now I'm going back a little bit to uh, the prayer uh, topic that I've been kind of ongoing with. It's kind of this backside, you know, uh, in the back burner always uh, study. Um, we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer and kind of walking through how the Lord's Prayer is an outline for prayer. It's, it's not something we need to just vainly repeat and say over and over and over, and that's going to be where our blessing comes from. In fact, it's not even a prayer that the Lord made. He, he taught the disciples how to pray using what we know as the Lord's Prayer. So when he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and so on and so on and so on. Quite often what I've done and when I've had, had the best experience in my prayer life I've taken our Father which art in heaven and I've meditated upon that, thought about that, talked about God and how to God, how He's personal to me and how He's my Father, our Father, He's, He's possession of mine, I have Him as my Father. What a glory it is that you could be my Father. You say, who art in heaven, given position of where He resides, showing that He is exceedingly high, and I am low and lifted up, and I'm going to meditate upon those things and use the Lord's Prayer there as my guideline for things. And then the next part is, Hallowed be Thy name. Hallowed be Thy name. And as I go through in my prayer time, I'm going to think about the holiness of the name of God, the name that's above every name. Uh, it talks to His prestige and His power over us. And, and, and then you continue on in your prayer in that same vain and you continue to bring God uh, as he outlined uh, responses that are according to that and that's kind of like the outline for prayer God's not big on giving outlines for things but when he does it's good that we pay attention because um, I know in my workplace and maybe some of you have the same experience people when they need to do something it's good for them to have steps it's good for them to have a routine a work instruction is what we call them in the world that I live in outside of church and so God here has given us a prayer instruction, point by point by point by point, all the topics that we need to address in a good, well-rounded prayer. The next one is, Hallowed be thy name. And Psalm 52 uh, speaks more to the holiness of the name of God than, than I, I, I've, ever, I've ever experienced, really, in, in, my, in my routine of, of, of praying and studying throughout the week and just, just reading the next portion of scriptures that's in my chronological Bible. I came across Psalm 52 and, and, and knew that this study was always in the back burner, but really didn't know how I was ever going to get it in. And then Psalm 52 jumped out at me. I'm just going to read it for you. Psalm 52. It says, Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. And I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. So this psalm, in contrast to how men react, specifically wicked men, this psalm rings out proving and declaring and, and proclaiming the power of the great power in the name of God. He says, why boastest thyself? Go back to verse 1. He says, why boastest thyself in mischief, O mighty man? So in the areas of, of dealings with God, we know that specifically regarding salvation, you can't boast before God. You can't stand before God and give Him all of your works. Give Him all of your actions. Give Him all of your righteous deeds. Boasting, lifting them up before Him and expect for His blessings to return unto you. 
And even so, is just in general, in the life that we live before a holy, righteous God, how can we ever boast before Him? Never should men boast before a righteous God. So here he makes the statement, well, why boastest thyself, O mighty man? You can almost hear the condescension in the, in the statement. Why boastest thyself, O mighty man? Why are you boasting there, tough guy? You know, big man, right? Hey, hey, son, take it down a notch there, tiger, right? He's, he's condescending to the mighty man that is making mischief before God. Talking down to him, you think you're so high. You think you're something special. You think you're lifted up. You think you're great. You think you're wonderful. Why boast this thyself, O oh, mighty man? And in contrast to the man that boasts before God, he gives that condescending response and then says this, The goodness of God endureth continually. The goodness of God endureth continually. If you were to look back in Exodus chapter 33, you'll find that Moses asked specifically to see the glory of God. And there in 33 and verse 19, the response was made, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. So when Moses wanted to see the great and wonderful glory of God, the response was, hey, you can see my goodness. My goodness will pass before thee, but you can't see my face and live. There's no one going to be able to see my face and live. So why in the context of this psalm do you find this man puffing himself up? How do you puff yourself up in the presence of a God where even his choice servant, even his, his beloved Moses, cannot stand nor survive the sight of him. How do you puff yourself up and boast before a God like that? Where even his most cherished and loved servant can't even see him and live. Yet this same God says to his redeemed that statement, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow thee all the days of your life. So why boastest thyself, O oh man? The goodness of God endureth continually. It never ends. It goes on and goes on and goes on. Turn back to Psalm chapter 31. You can keep your finger there in 52. Go back to Psalm chapter 31. Psalm 31 in verse 19. The Bible reads, Oh, how great is thy goodness! which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strifes of tongues. And here God in his goodness, he proclaims, that those that fear God should have shelter from pride, should have shelter from strife, should have shelter from the attacks of the tongues of men. And even so, you find that it doesn't mean a thing. Men are still going to come at you. Men are still going to come, and they're going to attack. Why boastest thyself in mischief, O oh, mighty man? And even we personally have known some who are constantly fighting against us, constantly boasting against us. In our lives, in our, in our families, in our workplace, even as a church, and more recently we've seen it reared up again. And it will again, and again and again, we will constantly have people boasting themselves against us, and with their tongues attacking us. Verse 2 of Psalm 52. It says, Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs, like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. So here the mischief is devised. There's this deceitful work going on. These that are making the deceitful work, they love evil and lying more than good and speaking righteousness. Yet God's not surprised by this. God's not concerned. Why? Because His goodness 
endureth continually. The part of God that we can get a hold of. You can't see his face, but his goodness is constantly extended out to us. He still asks that question, why boastest thyself, O man? We know that the wicked are constantly boasting against us, but how much do we personally, in our own lives, boast against God? Why boasteth thyself, O mighty man? We're talking today about his holy name. His holy name. Verse 4 says, Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Why are you boasting? Why are you lifting yourself up, O mighty man? Why are you loving these lying words? Why are you speaking evil? Why are you devouring with your words, O thou deceitful tongue? O mighty man, you're a little big for your britches there, aren't you, buddy? Aren't you, sonny boy? Verse 5 says, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. We need to not forget, especially when it comes to our prayer life, that we have a God that is love. We have a God that is light. We also have a God that is a consuming fire. We have a God that is mighty and terrible. We have a God to whom vengeance belongeth. And he executes the same with furious rebukes. We say in our prayer time, our Father, you're mine, I possess you. You are my Father, I love you. You're in heaven, who art in heaven. Glorified, high and lifted up. Hallowed be thy name. This same God is the one that is holy, is righteous, is the judge of all. And he is the one that executes furious rebukes on the haters of God, but also those that hate God's people. If you were to turn to Galatians chapter 3, go to Galatians chapter 3. What we need to understand is that as Christians, we can take the promises of Scripture and rightfully apply them to us. You're going to Galatians chapter 3. Let me read Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, it sheds more light on this statement. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now today, are you in Christ? Are you saved? Are you blood-bought, born again, child of the King? If you are, you can take that to your prayer time. Hallowed be thy name. Well, what is the name above every name? It's Jesus. And take that confidence with you. In the holy name of God, believe and call upon him and ask him into your prayer closet to do great exploits for you. Do you have enemies attacking you? Do you have people in your lives, in your family, in your workplace that are attacking you with a malicious tongue? Take it to the God that judges righteously. Galatians 3 verse 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. If you're in the faith that Abraham followed, if you're believing in Christ, believing God, have the imputed or accounted righteousness placed upon you, you have access by prayer to that power that comes from the God who is named above all. God's, the name above all names. You can bring him with you in prayer. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. A few pages to the right. Philippians 2. And in verse 9 it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Here in this world, and that's what the, the psalm we just looked at was talking about. Why boastest thyself, O man? Why exalteth thyself, O O oh man, why do you lift yourself up, O oh man? We find here that God hath highly exalted Christ. 
Christ didn't lift himself up. He didn't boast himself. He was lifted up and exalted by the God of heaven, the Father. And given him a name, it was given to him, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This name above every name. This name highly exalted. This name royal and regal and above all high and lifted up. Belongs to our Lord. Belongs to Jesus. So why do men boast themselves? The interesting thing about the, na- the idea of name is that it doesn't just apply to the actual name given to him, Jesus. The name above every name, Jesus. But it also speaks to the fact that he has a good name. He has a good reputation. God, above all, has a reputation for being holy, for being righteous, for being love, for being light. But we also have to remember that the all-encompassing idea of the name of Christ involves him being the consuming fire. It involves him being mighty and terrible and the one to whom vengeance belongeth. God exists in both. Love, light, peace, mercy, judgment, justice, destruction from those that cross him and upon those that cross him. His name, the Lord. His name, the Almighty. His name, the Holy One. His name, the Ancient of Days. His name, the Great I Am. Jesus, yes, is above every one of them. So why boasteth thyself, O man? Why do we lift ourselves up? Go back to Psalm chapter 52. It's amazing to see how when God's doing something, when God's working, when God's trying to get through to people, how often we just refuse. We just refuse. And these we hear in the direct context of of David, the Bible says, um, my Bible says that this was written when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul what had happened. When David was come to the house of Abimelech, and as he passed on from thence, Doeg the Edomite followed up and he destroyed the entirety of the house and all the priests that were there. He's calling out to such a wretched man as Doeg, saying, Why boasteth thyself? Oh man, God's goodness is going to get you. It's funny to us, and it's also humbling to see the puffed up and the proud and how they act in this world. Psalm 52 and verse 6 says, The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. And that great fear should bring a self-reflection unto us. That great fear should cause us to warn people that we see, that are erring before God, that are boasting themselves, that are devising mischief, that are attacking God's men, that are speaking evil against God, that are fighting after Him and lying rather than speaking righteousness. The fear also, as as much as it is an inner reflection, it brings us to a point where we understand ourselves in light of God's righteousness, should also desire and bring a determination to us to warn others not to follow in this path. Verse 6 says, The righteous also shall see and fear. Shall even laugh at him. Some of those it's too late for it. If you go to Psalm, if you keep your finger in Psalm chapter 52, you can go to Proverbs chapter 1. Sometimes we laugh because we see the foolish acting foolishly. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 20 shows that it's too late for some. It says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Again, that, that, that condescending tone that wisdom gives. Ye simple ones, how long will ye love simplicity? How long will you love your ignorance? And the scorners delight in their scorning. The fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will laugh at your calamity. 
I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not have my counsel and despised all my reproofs. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own ways and shall be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple will slay them. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. If there's one thing that we can learn from a scripture like this, say yes, we need to get to the lost first before it's too late for them. But also personally, we need to hearken and we need to hearken quickly. God is constantly giving us wisdom, giving us knowledge. In our Bible reading and the preaching of God's word, he's constantly crying out in the chief place, crying out in the openings of the gates. In the city, wisdom is uttering her words. Hey, simple one, how long will you love being simple? Scorner, how long will you love scorning? Fools, you hate knowledge. Please turn. I beg you, turn at my reproofs. I'm pouring out my knowledge, wisdom is saying. I'm making known my words, but you refused. You denied them. You said no to them. And this is what happens. God is constantly reaching out, constantly determined to bring people to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth. And yet they have set not his counsel, and they would none of his reproofs. Therefore, the point comes where the decision is made. When your fear cometh, i got to laugh. I will mock when your fear cometh. I will laugh at your calamity. When your fear cometh, when your destruction enters in, when distress and anguish is upon you, I am going to remember all the times I reached out and said, be reproved. Don't be simple. Don't be a scorner. Love knowledge. How many times has God reached out? And he'll remember even when he laughs and their fear is coming. Even when he mocks when their destruction enters in. Then, the Bible says, shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Then shall they seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So when we have the fear of God entering into us, check yourself, warn others. But unfortunately for some, it's too late. They've, they've chosen their end. They've chosen the bitter destruction that is looming upon them. Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell in safety and shall be quiet from the fear of the evil. Now we know that there is those who have been given over to a reprobate mind. They have been, they have been constantly drawn and constantly taught and constantly instructed and then knew God, but they glorified him not as God. We too are going to see the wicked, the reprobate, the one given over to that darkened Mind, the hardened one that knew God but didn't glorify him. We're going to see them. And at, that, at that state, what else can you do but just laugh when their destruction comes? But God forbid, God forbid that even Christians would be so blinded by their own pride, by their own puffed up upness, by their own lack or sense of 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 I am of worth, I am boasting myself, I am a mighty man, I am something when I am not. God forbid that they would similarly in this life taste of the same destruction that comes upon the wicked. To those that know God and see, it's almost laughable when the wicked fall. But when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ or those that confess his name fall into the same destruction, it's a nervous laugh. Why are you boasting yourself? What are you even doing, man? Make God your strength. Trust in him. That's what it says in verse 7. Lo, this man made not God his strength, but trust in the abundance of his riches and strengthen himself in his wickedness. How often have I called out to Christians and said, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Make God your strength. Trust Jesus. Have faith. Quit making these bonehead decisions. Quit puffing yourself up. Be wise. Come on. Verse 8 and 9 says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. 
I trust in the mercy of God forever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. And we see too often that our Christian friends turn from God. They stop making him the strength. They stop making him whom they're trusting in. We need to be as this is, as David is, when he plants himself in the house of God. This isn't, this isn't planting yourself in front of a sermon in the living room. This isn't, this isn't going door to door. This isn't feeding the sick. This isn't helping people cross the roads. This isn't all your good works. This is literally planting yourself in the house of God. And if you plant yourself in the house of God, it's also not church shopping. You're not planting yourself here and then uprooting yourself and then going and planting yourself here in this house and then uprooting yourself. Planting yourself over here and then uprooting yourself. It makes for a very sick olive tree it will eventually wither and die you need to be planted in the house of God trusting God in his name and his goodness and his mercy that will follow us all the days of our lives the Bible here says I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it and I will wait on thy name for it is good before the saints it's God's goodness that's going to bring us through a thing it's God's goodness that's going to care for us in situations but it's, as we know, not always imminent, not always immediate, not always right now. Sometimes we go through some things, and this is what David was experiencing. The boasting of the wicked against him. The tongue that devises mischief. The, the sharp razors that work deceitfulness in his life. The evil, the wrong, the wickedness of his enemies. But here David... In that moment of prayer that he had, took that next point in the prayer outline. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he recognized at the conclusion of the whole matter that it is his name that needs to be waited upon. It is his goodness before the saints that needs to be waited upon. And he couldn't doubt this. He couldn't worry. He couldn't jump ahead. He couldn't go and take his own sword to destroy the devouring tongues of mischief. He needed to wait on God. And we today need to wait on God. But this is something, this is an action that we can take in our lives and also in our prayer lives where we can trust in His holy name to do what He has appointed, to do what He desires next for us, to do what He wants. And that's what we got to do. We need to acknowledge that Christ's name is holy and allow him to work his own righteousness into our lives. But look at the warnings that come through in this portion of scriptures. There's a wicked man, yes, but how often do Christians have that same heart of boasting of themselves? And God talks down to them in such a way, and David confidently affirms that God will destroy him. He will take him away. He will pluck him out of the land of the living. Because David knows that what this man needed to do is what we all need to do. Make God his strength. Trust in the abundance of his riches. And be strengthened by God. And to be carried by the name that he has appointed for us. And that is Jesus. If you're a Christian today, if you are in Christ you don't need to worry when people come at you. You don't need to worry about when people are attacking you. You don't need to worry about when, when the world is, is telling you one thing and trying to convince you to do anything in front of God. You just need to trust and you need to wait. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. It's going to be laughable when everything comes to an end. Trust in God in prayer and in actions. Don't doubt. Don't doubt. His name above all will lift you up. His name above all will sustain you. His name will give you what you are missing. The best thing that we can do is when God speaks, hearken unto him. Don't puff yourself up against him. Help other Christians. Lift up other Christians. And when people are backsliding, encourage them to make God your, their strength. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Get planted in the house of God. But too often we see that they just simply won't. We find even here that the statements made that liken the person that would turn away from God as a believer to the same end as somebody that rejected God in the first place. 
And this is why it is so important, Christians, that we get to know Christ. We get to seek after his name and desire what he wants and to know his reputation and to know who he is so that we can be carried and sustained and lifted up by him. Thank you, Father.